Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit now and open our ears, our heart, and our souls to hear your word, to gladly receive it, and to grow in our faith. We pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you listen to the gospel lesson for today, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out the end of the world is at hand. In fact, Jesus said something interesting to his disciples. If you caught it, most people never catch it. He says, this generation will not pass away before these signs come. And what, what always I marvel at is all these people in the world that are still looking for the end times. They're out here looking for something in the future when right under their nose, in fact, since the day Jesus rose from the dead, the end has been at hand. It's nothing new. In the book of Revelation, we hear of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and good Hebrew scholars know that what that's speaking of is the per perfect reign of Christ, which happened the day he rose from the dead. And since that day he rose from the dead, the end times have been part of our lives. If you look out there, there are earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, parents against children, and children against parents. And it's been happening for thousands of of years. And yet, when we look to the judgment, when we look to the final return of Jesus, people are so afraid. And let's be honest about that for a moment. In a church today, a global church that's filled with modern evangelicals who don't go to seminary, who are uneducated as being pastors, who don't understand Greek and Hebrew, and who totally mess up the word of God, there is no wonder that the world today is so afraid of the return of Jesus Christ. They totally make it all about the law. They totally make it about how you live your lives. They totally want to make it about your good works. They totally want to keep people in fear because as the modern evangelical world keeps people in fear, they can keep you under the grasp of the church's control and their thumb because it's all about power and money for most churches these days. So I want to turn that on its head and tell you what we Lutherans really think about this. The reality is there's nothing to fear. You see, the world wants to believe that this judgment of Jesus is going to be so scary that when Jesus returns, we're going to stand before him and he's going to read off every one of our sins as a punishment for what we've done in this world. And we're going to have to go through this trial with lawyers and, and Satan standing there. Let me tell you today, this is totally a lie that has been taught to you by modern Christianity. Because here's the thing. The judgment of Jesus Christ has already been pronounced. Why in the world would we pray for as a church so much for the return of Jesus Christ if there was something to be afraid of? If you were afraid of it, would you pray for it? I certainly wouldn't. You don't hear people saying, Lord, give me cancer. Lord, give me this illness. Lord, let me be in a car accident. Why then would be the church pray, come Lord Jesus? In fact, every time you say the common table prayer, the words come Lord Jesus come from straight at the end of Revelation, and it's praying truly, not only for Jesus to be our guest in that meal, but for him to return quickly, because that has been the prayer of the church for thousands of years, that Jesus would return quickly. Also, it's seen in our liturg liturgy. Very often in our liturgy, especially those liturgies we do in the evening or at night during Advent, we will use those during Lent, we use them. It said, we say at the beginning of the service, the Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. That peace at the last, it's not talking about the end of the day. We're praying for Jesus to come and to give us peace on that last day. To give us peace on that last day when we're risen up from the dead to be with him. The reality is there's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, if we truly believe God in his word, what does his word say about fear? God is love and perfect love does what? Casts out all fear. So on one hand, we have a church that says, be afraid of that day. And on the other hand, we have the true word of God that says, there is no fear in love because I am perfect love. Which one do you want to believe? The true word of God or the church and society of today? God is love and perfect love casts out all fear. This is the reality of the church. And nowhere is the perfect love of God more evident than in the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we know on that great and final day when he comes, 
He's going to tell you, welcome home. You are not guilty. You are saved. Come on into heaven. How do we know this is true? First of all, we know it because God deigned to become human flesh. He made his dwelling among us. He made his dwelling among us to live with us, John tells us. He made his dwelling to be one of us, to live our life, to suffer as we suffered, to take on our sin, to take on perfection, the law, to live it perfectly so that now we are credited with his perfect righteousness. That's a big part of the deal, folks. The reason Jesus at the end is able to say to us, your sins are forgiven, you are perfect, come on into heaven, is because he lived the law perfectly and gave that perfection to us when he died on the cross. Not only did he take our sins away from us and forgive us to remove them as far as the east is from the west, but he gives us, he imputes to us, he gives us, he covers us, uh, covers us with his perfect righteousness. So that when God the Father looks down upon us, he sees Jesus Christ. He sees us as perfect, redeemed, and forgiven. Now I don't know about you, but I am a big old sinner and when I hear that I leap for joy I leap for joy because even though I am a sinner and fall way short of the glory and grace of God I know with confidence because God is loved because of the work of Jesus Christ in his death on the cross that my sins are forgiven and so are yours. But it didn't stop there. No, three days later he rose forth from the grave sealing that whole cross deal and showing us that we would live for eternity with him. And then he ascended into heaven and what does he say? I go there to prepare a place for you. Now does all of this sound scary? It sure doesn't to me. And if the gospel is truly about love and the gospel is truly about forgiveness and eternity, why in the world would Jesus come back as a scary judge? He's not about scariness. He's not about fear. He's about love and gospel and forgiveness and life. So with anticipation and joy, we can look forward to that day of his return. What a glorious day, a marvelous day that Jesus has in store for us. In fact, there are many places that scripture teaches us the, the, this, this very truth, that we are not guilty, that we are restored, that we are forgiven, that we have eternal life. The whole dialogue between John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 17 says, for God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world for him. And then 18 is crucial. It tells us that God came into the world and those who believe are already saved and those who do not believe are condemned because they have not believed in the one and only son of Jesus Christ. Their condemnation rests upon them. Our salvation rests upon Jesus. We're forgiven and free. So I dig up in scripture, I want to share a couple of Bible passages with you that are very important. And I want you to really listen to these and let them soak in because this is the love of God active in your lives. From Romans chapter two. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hand and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. How will he render to each one according to his works? To those who by patience and well-doing seek his glory and honor and mortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but only obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and then the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also for the Greek. For God shows no partiality. There we hear the very words of St. Paul. For those of us that are in Christ Jesus, there will be glory and honor and praise and forgiveness and grace pronounced upon our lives. Again in Romans 8, St. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I, oh, listen to that. Despite what the other churches teach you, this is one of the great and wonderful things about being Lutheran. Please listen to this. There is now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of the sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled on our behalf, who walk not according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For those who set their minds on the flesh, on the flesh is death. But to those uh, who set their mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Brothers and sisters, that is a great and wonderful day. I can't wait for Jesus' return. I can't wait until this world goes bye-bye. But in the meantime, where does that leave us? Two things. Number one, it leaves us with the certainty, without any doubt, that because Jesus Christ is alive and has risen from the dead, our sins are forgiven and the gift of heaven is ours. Nothing can take that away. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. And we have nothing to fear because fear is from Satan. God's love casts it all out. Number two, where does that leave us? It leaves us with a great need. The most urgency in our lives to reach those who don't know Jesus. You and I have everything. We've been given everything. In baptism, we've been given the kingdom of God. And oh, how nice it is to come to church and to worship and to do those things we do. And then to go home, right? And to live our weeks. We have nothing to fear. Heaven is ours. The sad reality is there are people who live next door to us, people in our workplaces, People in our homes, maybe. Our friends. They have a lot of fear. Heaven isn't their home yet. And so it leaves us with the love of Jesus. A message that will save the world. Simply by becoming a friend to someone you know and loving them without judgment as Jesus loves them. And by doing so, numbers are added to heaven daily and all heaven rejoices. In the name of Jesus, amen.